My name is Gina San Inocencio. I use the she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Associate Director for the Community Health Training Institute. If you are here for Managing Power Dynamics in Coalitions, you're in the right place. Welcome. Uh, the Community Health Training Institute is a partnership project between Health Resources in Action and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, and because of the generous funding we get through DPH, all of the trainings and resources uh, that we provide through CHTI are absolutely free. We're really excited to be here with you all today. This is sort of midpoint of the year for us um, in our training calendar. Um, and in a second, I'm going to pass it to our trainers to say hello, but just wanted to let you know um, that we're really excited to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. I do see some familiar faces, um, which is always nice. We welcome you to all of our trainings. We have trainings all throughout the year. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I encourage you all to participate as much as you can. Uh, what enriches trainings like these is having you all speak in your experience, your questions, and really engage with the content and the trainers themselves. Um, if you are in Massachusetts, I know not everyone is, you might be dealing with a little bit of snow. You might be dealing with some children home from school today, like I am. So I'm going to um, apologize ahead of time. Sorry, not sorry. I may be on and off camera <laughs> uh, dealing with my own children at home, but invite you all to do the same. Like we recognize that, yeah, this is kind of the world that we live in now. Um, so if you've got pets and children and spouses and things in the background, do what you need to do um, to take care of yourself as we're going through this training. So with that being said, I'll just pass it to our team to say hello. So I will pass it to uh, Victoria to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Victoria. Um, I'm the admin coordinator for CHTI, so I'll be doing everything tech today. So if you have any issues, feel free to message me in the chat um, and I'll pass it to Paula. Hi, everyone. I'm Paula, pronouns are she, hers. Um, I'm new to the CHTI team, so I'm here to observe how these trainings go and I'm happy to be here. I'll pass it. Uh, I'm passing it off to anyone or... I think we can pass it to the trainers to say okay, hello. Gotcha. So. Um, Lauren, go for it. Thanks, Paula. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Lauren Bard. I use she, her pronouns. I am a senior training manager at Health Resources in Action. So my work here is mostly all training all the time, a lot largely in the youth development space and in the overdose prevention and rescue space. Um, which are large parts of public health. My career background is in youth development. So I've done lots of work um, in the city of Boston with young people and families and communities and every place you can imagine that happening from schools to summer camps to the juvenile justice system. I've just been around the way in that area in Boston. So it's a little bit about me and I will pass it over to Winston. Thank you, Lauren. Winston Daly, Senior Training Manager at HRIA. Uh, we'll be working with Lauren today for the next three hours. I've uh, been with HRIA a little over a year, but in the training and facilitation space for the last eight. Previous to that, I was in uh, the world of finance and the private sector and institutional investing uh, for about 13 years before transitioning to wanting to work with young people. So uh, just similar to Lauren, been in the, the city of Boston for the most part, working in high schools, as well as in community around equity and access, as well as um, all manner of engagement for uh, families and youth in the city. So very happy to be here with you all today. Um, for everyone um, who hasn't attended one of our trainings, we like it to be a bit uh, interactive. So there'll be plenty of breakout groups and the opportunities to converse. But Lauren and I will do a lot of level setting here in the beginning. So looking forward for the next uh, three hours. So Gina. All right, thank you all so much. I just wanted to say um, that if you have any questions, if you have any tech issues, feel free to message us in the chat box. Uh, you can email us at traininginstitute at hria.org. Um, but otherwise, I am happy to pass it back to our trainers to officially kick us off. All right, thank you. So let's get going. Let's see what we got on this next slide. A couple of headshots, there we are. We already said who we are. Um, okay, Zoom 101. So we don't wanna assume that everyone knows everything about Zoom. Maybe you're using Teams all the time. So we'll just do a little overview. 
on Zoom and some of the things we'll be doing today. So on the bottom left hand corner, you all have found the mute button. So we love that if you're not speaking, you're on mute, but please do be ready to come off mute and share, um, especially out in those breakout rooms, but also in this large space. You've got the show video button or the hide video button. Um, if, if you're able to be on camera, we'd love to see you. Um, if you have you know kids running around or bandwidth issues, that's no worries. You feel free to pop off camera. Um, you can see there's a chat button down there in the bottom um, on the right, sort of in the middle. And so you can drop messages in the chat to the whole group. Um, participation is really like any way that you can. So if you want to drop comments in the chat, you want to use the raise hand function and come off mute, you want to um, come off mute and share out, that's great. We're going to be, Winston and I will talk a lot in the beginning, but it will not be this way the whole time, I promise. <clears throat> um, you can see on the top there, we will use the annotate feature at one point. So, um, and we'll walk you through it at that time, but the view options button next to your viewing Victoria Nemitz screen, we'll have a drop down, and you'll be able to hit the annotate and it'll pop up a toolbar with some, you know, options to, to draw and write on the screen. And yeah, you can do speaker view or gallery view, whatever your preference is. I personally, I have gallery view and since there's a, a, a zoom, um, PowerPoint being shown, I like to toggle over the the middle bar so I can see so many more of your faces than just, you know, the first five. So <clears throat> I think, yeah, if you want to change your name, you can do that. <clears throat> add pronouns or add, you know, the coalition that you're part of or where you are. That way folks can start to network. A great thing about these trainings is that you get to meet folks from around the state and around the country doing similar work and maybe you'll want to stay in touch. So to do that, you would hover over your box with your name on it and click on the three dots and there's an option to rename so you could rename yourself there if you wish and if you you know want to you could message us what you want it to be and we could do it for you if that's an issue um, no problem i think that's about it on this slide for zoom 101 <clears throat> if for some reason your bandwidth starts to go haywire and uh, you need to call in to get the audio via phone you would navigate down to where you have the mute button and click that little carrot. It'll pop up and say, switch to phone audio. And if you click on that button, switch to phone audio, it gives you the call in number and it gives you your pin, your, like your participant ID number. And that's what you'd enter to be able to link up to the audio on your phone. So if that is needed, that is a option for folks. <clears throat> okay. We will be using breakout rooms. So um, Victoria will be managing that and sending folks off to rooms and um, we use the broadcast feature to send out reminders. Um, usually there's a 60 second countdown when we decide to pull you back, um, but you can always leave the breakout room if you need to, if you have questions or whatever. Um, just be careful because the leave meeting button is really close to the leave breakout room button. So if you do happen to get lost and you want to log back in, we will let you right back in. Um, yeah, all the controls are the same out there in the breakout room. Okay, so for today, between now and 1230, we're going to talk about like why does your coalition exist? We're going to define power, talk about dimensions of power, we'll do some power mapping, and talk a little bit about leveraging power. And hopefully, I mean, my I really think that all the knowledge that we need is here in the room, right? Like Winston and I aren't the experts coming down with like, here's the answers to all your questions. Like you all are doing a lot and you know a lot and sharing that information among you is going to be probably the most useful thing today. So there will be opportunity for that. And there's a break in the middle too. So no worries. <laughs> we'll, we'll get a little break. So today's learning objectives include defining power and exploring the role of power in your work. We will identify ways in which power influences your relationships and experiences within the community and identify, hopefully you'll leave here with at least two strategies on how to leverage your power positively in your community work. And I know a lot of our work is trying to help folks, uplift, uplift folks and uplift other voices, you know? And so sometimes it's learning when to step back and, you know, let others lead. So it can be challenging, but we're gonna talk through it together today. So those are our objectives. And we like to begin every group endeavor with some group agreements. Um, so these are some suggested agreements that we have for our time together including if you can leave your camera on, we do, we really do love that. So if it's possible, um, please be on camera if you can. If not, we understand. Um, the other thing is we hope that what's learned here 
will leave here, but what's said here will stay here. So you're going to take the lessons, but not the details. So when you go and share all the great things you learned with your colleagues, you won't necessarily have to say that, you know, so-and-so from this coalition had this challenge <laughs> and this is how they, you know, you could just be more general about, you know, taking away the lessons and leaving the specific details. So that's our confidentiality or the Vegas rule, as we like to call it sometimes. <laughs> the next one is take space, make space. And so right now I'm taking up a lot of space, but pretty shortly I will be making space for others to take space. So the, really that's all that means is just like be, be mindful of um, the amount of airtime you're using. And if you're not using any airtime, take some because we want to hear you. So that's our take space, make space agreement. We want everyone to respect themselves and others. So if respecting yourself means getting off camera and going to get some water or going to the bathroom or whatever it is you need to do, you take care of yourself. You got to do what you got to do. Um, and then respecting others. We're just, we're here to, you know, listen and learn from each other and, you know, share ideas and um, to just show respect to one another. Our oops and our ouch, this gives me the chance that if I say something that I think uh, landed wrong, like I may have offended someone with, with these words, I could say, oops. And you would know, I already caught it. I already heard myself say it. And I'm going to, you know, maybe rephrase it or, you know, try to say something differently. Um, and that's the oops. If we say something that we want to claw back <laughs> and rephrase, um, we've got that oops. Um, and the ouch is, let's say I do that and I'm oblivious and I totally have no idea that I said something that landed wrong. If you were to say ouch, I would be like, hold on, I need to put a pin in that. I need to think about what I just said. I need to like address that. So that's the oops ouch that we can use with one another. Now, that was a lot. Is there anything else that you would hope we would have as an agreement for our time together. And you're like, why don't they have such and such a thing on this slide and we should go back at the end of the day and add it to the slide because it's important. See what I did there? I just made space. That silence, you thought it was an awkward silence? No, that was me making space for you to come up mute or draw something in the chat. Um, so, all right, well, if we think these agreements are things that we can abide by today for our time together, could I get a thumbs up from each of you? You could either use your human hands, you could get your pet up on screen and show us their paw, you could use the thumb emoji, I like that. Um, yep, very good. Folks found the reaction buttons, great, okay. Wonderful. All right, so now it's your turn. We are going to be, because there's, you know, a few of us in here, it would take, it would take up a lot of valuable time for us to do our introductions all one-on-one -on -one in the big room. So we're going to give you the chance to connect with some of your colleagues around the state and country by putting you into some breakout rooms and you can share your name, share your pronouns if you wish, and then share what organization or coalition you're representing, your job title, you can share like your community, what location you're coming from, all that logistical information, just so y'all can introduce yourselves to one another. And then the little prompt is like, what's one thing you enjoy doing outside of work? Just some, some activity that you're into outside of work. Um, this weather reminds me how much I really enjoy snowmobiling and I do it probably once a year, but it is one of my favorite things to do outside work. So there, there's mine. Um, any questions before we send you off into breakouts? We're going to give you about 10 minutes. So you get to meet three or four other folks. And if Victoria, if those breakout rooms are ready, feel free to launch. Madison, either you stepped away or you're having trouble finding your breakout room. But if it's the latter, let us know and we can try to help. Thank hey everyone. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good time meeting your colleagues. Um, I think, you know, it's time to jump in. So I'm gonna hand it over to Winston to get us into the work together. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, so to start, uh, we really want to 
start at the at the basics, right? Why are we here? Why is it important to you in your coalition to discuss power and its impacts and its uses? So we want to start with asking you this question. Why does your coalition or organization, commission, alliance, team, you see all, all of the synonyms that we have there, why does it exist? What is its purpose, its mission? Um, anyone will raise their hand and come off mute and share, or you can please drop it in the chat and I will read it in. But tell us, why does your coalition exist? I will take the silence as contemplative, introspective thought, the creation of a, a very deep mission statement. <laughs> Truly thoughtful consideration as to the why. Okay. Let me see. I'm going to start with, uh, I, am I saying, is it I'm? Just because I really like the uh, the Growing Places logo. To change our food system to one that works. Thank you. Please let me know if I pronounce your name incorrectly as well. Uh, Chelsea, to advance a broad scope of health for all residents in our region. Thank you. To improve SNAP and ED programming. Is that, Amanda, is that SNAP like the uh, food program? Uh, yeah, so SNAP. It's the education component to SNAP, so SNAP Ed. Thank you, man. Joyce, many hands make light work. Thank you, Joyce. Joyce, could you expand on that? What does that mean for your organization? Rosa, mission to bring I'm together. a um, member of a lot of different coalitions and groups by virtue of my job but mm -hmm. i think when many people come together there's a lot of ideas there's a different viewpoint there's just it just makes the work easier um in a good way so a lot of voices a lot of input um sharing power thank you joyce from may to ensure that positive positive changes we're working towards in the community are community driven ensure that everyone is represented and reflective of the strengths and culture of the town thank you may Kate, tobacco awareness and prevention. Dominic, also improvement in SNAP ed programming and evaluation and food access. All right. Any others that we didn't get to, folks are thinking about? Okay. Right. Uh, Victoria, you can jump to the next slide. I'm going to ask you all. Oh, Stephanie, thank you. Marielle, to improve food access, made the system more equitable. Thank you, Stephanie. Working collaboratively to reduce and prevent youth substance abuse. Thank you. So why would we start here? Why would we deem it important to ask ourselves this question? Especially, why are we starting with this question if we're going to discuss power? What are our thoughts? Let's start here. I think it was cool that you framed the question around like why a coalition like I saw those other words on the screen like other words for like different groups that might kind of work in different ways and it was cool to think about like why a coalition work and I think that speaks to I think it was Joyce's um, comment in the chat about you know many people working together and the power of kind of collective impact um, and uh, yeah. Thank you is it Mina? It's Mina yeah thank you. Thank you Mina thank you. Right, discussing our coalition and the uh, uh, possibilities of collective action, absolutely. Others, why are we why are we starting here? Chelsea, if we have a mission, are the people we want to impact involved? Thank you, Chelsea. Yeah, thinking of. Power? I think. Action? Go ahead, Dominic. Yeah, I think that if we know why we exist, then we can know if we are veering from the mission or the vision. And right. all this comes with power. You know, everybody knows, has a direction in mind. 
But if we know that as a group, this is the direction we are taking. If let's say person B wants us to take the southbound, if we all agree that we are going northbound, then we can say that, you know what? Our aim is to go northbound. Okay. Thank you, Dominic. If you have that mission as kind of your North Star, um, those discussions around power, the execution of power should directly become easier, right? Because we're thinking of our mission and that is the goal, not the idea of hoarding power or who's in charge or um, whose voice is loudest or who gets to be uh, the boss, right? Uh, Chelsea saying, if we have a mission, are the people we want to impact involved? Thank you, Chelsea. It makes me think of um, Ayanna Presley uh, when she was running. One of the things that she said a lot um, was that those who are closest to the pain should be able to make the decisions, right? So there's the idea of our coalition start, they expand, but are the people who are the focus of the mission and the closest to the purpose, are they involved? And are we finding ways in which voices are elevated? Rosa, are we intentional with our mission? Thank you, Rosa Marielle. I think taking a step back to remind ourselves of our whys is important. Thank you. And I, and again, I hope I'm saying this correctly, start at the beginning to go on a journey together. Yes, go ahead, Gary. So I was just going to, I'm uh, going to add that I think that uh, uh, it helps it helps us to uh, to be focused on on things that are important that we don't kind of take everything for granted. Yeah, it's too easy to kind of take things for granted and not see sometimes some of the variables that are really important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, easy. That's kind of the missing the the forest and the trees, right? It's kind of a, an old cliche that works. So. Uh, the longer you go, the easier it is to move away from the mission. Easier to move towards purposes is that we're not the origin of your coalition. So thank you all, all great um, points. And so if we're starting to talk about ourselves and the why are we here, then you know let's talk about what is power. I think we have kind of in our heads a working definition or we can see it, but how often is it spoken in as to what power is, what it means, what does it look like? And so we have a couple of definitions here. Victoria, just slide to the next one that we think encompasses um, these ideas of power. Can I get someone to just read that first quote? I'll do it. Thank you, Joyce. Power can be defined as the degree of control over material, human, intellectual, and financial resources exercised by different sections of society. The control of these resources becomes a source of individual and social power. Thank you, Joyce. So framing it as control over material, human, intellectual, and financial resources. Right, in a bigger picture of our society. Can I ask someone to read that second definition? Power is dynamic, relational, and multidimensional, changing according to context, circumstance, and interest. Its expressions and forms can range from domination and resistance to collaboration and transformation. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. So framing power as not static, as constantly changing around our circumstances, our environment, right? I may be uh, in middle management at my um, place of work, but when I go home, um, perhaps my power dynamics are different in my household, right? I could be the head of household, I could be the person that makes the decisions there. And so we're always changing in terms of the people that we're speaking with, the folks that we are organizing with, and our relation to not only the mission, but the organization and the coalition. So we are not stuck in any one place of power, right? Even if we are not necessarily consciously thinking of it all the time, we are moving throughout our days and throughout our careers and our personal lives throughout power dynamics, through changing um, points of influence, Right. Um, sometimes we're the leaders and sometimes we are the followers. So with these definitions, 
how do these fit with your own working definition, right? Does anything stand out in these definitions for you? Is your understanding of power similar or different to either of these quotes or these definitions of power? Is there anything missing? I feel like I've learned, I'm not part of a coalition, but um, here in the hospital, I've learned how important um, just relationship building is um, in order to advocate for you know your larger mission statement and also just all the small pieces around um, and how strategic that has to be. <laughs> I think I've learned the hard way that piece. Yeah, thank you, Gabrielle. Being strategic in relationship building. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few folks who dropped some things in the chat here. Uh, Gary says, I'm struck by how much the language aligns with my understanding of politics. I agree with a lot of that, Gary, right? Um, politics, in a lot of ways, is the way that people express power, especially in our representative democracy. We are voting to exert power on what the most of us believe is, is the right way, whether it's local politics or um state and national right um that's also i think sometimes the execution of power is why so many folks may say they do not like politics or they don't want things to be political is that they do view these as weapons of power right whether you feel empowered or disempowered it certainly interacts with your view of politics politicians and and our system as a whole uh chelsea i'm chewing on the idea of resistance as power chelsea you want to add to that a little bit i like that um, it just made me think of, uh, I don't know, like resistance, I, I tend to think of as pushing back against power. Um, so more the domain of um, people who, who lack power, but then um, is there a space for resistance itself to make it, to, to give itself power and for um, you know, if you're trying to be collaborative and transformational to acknowledge resistance as a form of power and expressing power. Yeah. And that resistance can look a, a lot of ways, I think. Um, just coming off of a uh, sort of dimension of politics, there's always multiple sides, right? And each side views the other as resistance. And so there is power in, in, in that framing to start. And many of the organizations that we are a part of or have been a part of um, are built in resistance to something that we see um, in society. It is to push back against something that perhaps has become too accepted, something that does not work for our communities. And even if we may not think of it as like ultimate resistance, like that is often the impetus or the reason that our coalitions are put together in resistance or in answer to some inequity or um, something that we we feel should be changed. Thank you for that, Chelsea. But I do I do also agree with your point of um, what well, I agree. But I think your point is really important. Of um, resistance may not in the first part be seen as power, right? That it's just it's fighting back. But folks may not see themselves as powerful in that fight in the beginning. Uh, Stephanie, the ability to make change, Dominic, power can sometimes be invisible to the public. Dominic, I feel like you you, you did you look ahead in in the book. Because we're gonna have some discussion about that invisible power a little bit. No, you know, go start for dominant. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on these on these definitions? Any thoughts on the changing view of power? Of you know, do we see ourselves in that continuum a bit where there are spaces where we are incredibly powerful and others where we may be where we may sit back? And how do we manage or handle that those shifting um, identities? Uh, you know, Lauren and I work with young people a lot, and we are often in um, some unique positions of power just by nature of being an adult and working with young people. You are afforded um, a lot of power over their lives and their decisions and what they do to day to day. And there's an incredible amount of trust in that, right? If you run a youth program and you're creating programming, when you are connected to the community, 
when you work with parents and then you have your internal organizational structures where if you are a executive director or you lead an organization and you are now more focused on a uh, big picture overall mission versus if you are a staff member and you are much more focused on individual mission you know, those individual relationships to um, Gabrielle's point about changes in relationship building. Any other thoughts before we jump into some discussion about dimensions of power and what the what they look like? Was there anything in these definitions that we had not considered around power? I just add one thing that came up for me as y'all are talking is the power or empowerment, like when you're doing coalition work, working in a community, and if you're a member of that community, if you're part of the community, if you're working in your own community, how that may feel different than you, you know, you're hired to work into a community that maybe is next door to your community and you're like a visitor, you know, a guest in that community. And, you know, what kind of power you have when you're working for your own community versus the kind of power you're, you're afforded when you're on the payroll somewhere to do some work for a purpose for somebody else's mission. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying, but that just came up for me, <laughs> for me about the difference. Yeah, I, I think this week, um, Chelsea kind of echoes that in the chat as well. It's saying it can be hard to be in spaces where you have less power if you're used to having quite a bit. On the flip side, it can be freeing to have less power and to learn to grow. Uh, I like the freeing part. You know, I think I've seen a lot of movies, read a lot of books where folks give it all up. So I don't want I don't want to be a power, part of the power structure anymore. The freedom and uh, not having some of that responsibility that comes with power. Um, I think of so we're in Massachusetts and I live in the town of Milton. And we were supposed to have a vote today before the weather about the state idea of um, a lot of the communities are listed as. Um, high transit communities, if you have a T station in your town, um, that you have to build more affordable housing. And that has become incredibly contentious. We are the last town to vote on this issue. And there are folks who say, no, we do not want to build more affordable housing. We think it's wrong. We don't have the space. We don't feel empowered. And there are folks who say we need to build some of these spaces and that we are sharing the privilege and power of living in a town like this, and we should open that up to more folks. And with the, with the concept of power, it is funny that both sides use the idea of one, being disempowered, either by the state or disempowered in that if we vote now, we get to decide where things go and we get to decide how to bring in folks. And then both sides also use the idea of we are in charge of making those decisions and we are in charge of telling, pushing against people to say, we don't want these things. So both of those pieces, which again, relational, um, ever-changing and not static in the way that we talk to folks about their ways and power and how we organize, because both of those sides are coalitions. Um, folks have gathered on two different sides of an issue um, and are both using similar messaging with different purposes. All right. So uh, you can slide to go to the next slide. Uh, one more. Thank you, Victoria. So dimensions of power. Where do we see these things show up? Thank you, Beth. Power can be an act of dominance and how that relates to implicit bias, racism, et cetera. Thank you, Beth. And we're going to talk about some of those things, some of those isms, some of those invisible thoughts and ideas that really shape how we see power and how power has been given and executed. And that's what these three dimensions are. So first, the visible power, that's observable decision-making, right? It says it in the name, what we can see, um, things we can discuss, that's elections, political parties, budgets, bylaws, constitutions, right? It's observable decision-making about the how and why. That's coalition leadership and deciding you know, how your decisions are made. Um, what does your leadership look like across race, gender, class, and other identifiers, right? Regardless of our, our feel about identity and what identity means, it is used, right? It is, it is a part of our power structure that certain identities have more power in different spaces and others are, are disempowered. So we're going to discuss visible power where we see it in our work and in our coalitions. Um, can I get someone to read hidden power? 
what that means. Hidden power, um, setting the agenda, which community concerns are the focus of policy, and what identities and experiences are integrated into strategy. Thank you, Nina. So the hidden power, not as observable, more about the agenda, the mission, who in the community is the focus. Um, and in those identities and experiences, who gets to decide what's integrated into the strategy? Because our experiences and our identities do inform what we deem to be important. And that's a bit more hidden instead of, in terms of setting the agenda. Uh, Dominic, since you started it, could you read Invisible Power? Okay, shaping meaning. And how do individuals think about their place in their decision making and then impact of socialized roles and stereotypes? Yeah. So individualized roles and stereotypes, right? It's it is that idea of those isms, racism, classism, sexism, right? The impact of media, our mental models. Um, there is a great book called Whistling Vivaldi. That is about the impact of stereotypes simply by them being introduced and mentioned into marginalized groups, whether that's racially marginalized or marginalized by gender. And that's the invisible power. And one of the um, tests that are done in that book is having folks take a math test without any prompts and then having them take the math test, but telling them that their particular identity does poorly on these tests and the impact that that has just on the outcomes and the feeling of those test takers when they walk into the space. So we're gonna use our Zoom functions, the power of technology, and we are going to brainstorm. Uh, Victoria, you can jump ahead to the next slide. Versions of where do we see each of these examples in our coalitions, right? So, if you look at that screen there, we have visible power. The folks can go to the top of their screen under view options and you should be able to hit the annotate function. You can write on this slide places where you see visible power, what that looks like. Like what is visible power? Where have you seen it used? Everyone have the is everyone okay? Oh, you know, can't always trust the tech. Thank you, Gina. Couple of things in the chat I didn't get to. Chelsea's red, Bruce Lee Revolver. All right, I see a few folks type in grant making committees. Yes. And if you use the T function and annotate, you can type. It's easier than handwriting it out. But I appreciate the I love the handwriting. is <laughs> amazing. I've used it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Amelia. Like, this is slow. <laughs> Amelia was, I was going, going for it. I going to say who was present. But and within the coalition, within. Yeah, who showed up that day, right? Yeah. Town government, yep, absolutely. Having the power to change laws and policies. Grant making committees. Ah, facilitators tabling a discussion that many feel is important. Thank you. I think I've, I've definitely used the, the tabling term throughout the time, but we usually come back to it. We put a lot of stuff in the parking lot, but that's absolutely power, right? We can say that Lauren and I currently have some measure of power because we're responsible for content, the time, uh, your experience here. Uh, military, thank you, absolutely. Youth council, 
state funders. Finance committees. See folks, judicial system. All right, so we're leading into um, money, the law, the tenant association from Rosa. Thank you, Rosa. Hiring search committees as well. Or to health. Thank you, Viviana. Yeah. What about certain roles? I see a lot, a lot of this is uh sports teams. Yep. Even uh infrastructures within sports teams, coaches versus owners, GMs versus the players. What about roles and titles? I see we we've put a lot of um systems and big organizations. Are there any roles, any titles that immediately go with visible power? Unions, unions are both, right? Organizations built to sort of push back against existing power and have collective power, and then yet they also wield power. Executive directors, CEOs, bodies with historical power. That's kind of written over each other. Let me see if I can see it on the slide. No worries, you know, we can we can always move it, I think. I think we can always slide things over. Speaker of the House, yes. Political titles. Certain professions are deemed powerful. Yeah. Uh, I think Speaker of the House, certainly President, Senator, Mayor. Chairs, presidents, individuals with multiple roles. Right. And there's also the path to these titles that we're talking about, right? In terms of how do folks get to these spaces? Are they earned? Are they given? And how is that power wielded? The gavel when voting stops. Activists. Thank you. I think Gina's moving in. Thank you, Gina. It's not me. Someone else. <laughs> I tried, but I'm like, I don't know. It's not working for me. But someone did it. So thank you. Thank you. Community members not getting paid for participation while professions are paid by the organization to participate. Can we whoever wrote that? Can we get a can we get a, a, a little bit a little bit more on that? Is that for a volunteer? Is that how, how what's the vision for how that works? Where community members are involved for free, but uh, other folks mm -hmm. are paid. Hi, Scott. Um, I'm the one to put that in. It's one of the things that I've been um advocating for in my organization. So people um and grants that we're getting and and we're just moving to a more um equitable um engagement with communities mm -hmm. and um so many times i've seen like the maternal mortality review or the maternal health task force or a doula initiative will have health insurers will have um obgyns and other provider groups there and their organizations pay them to be there and they get paid pretty darn well. Um, and we're paid to be there as DPH staff, but we want to engage people with lived experience, people who are doing this in the community, um, and they don't necessarily get paid to be there. Um, and their pay is not equitable um, compared to everyone else. So one of the things I advocate for is making sure that no matter what grant we get, we put aside funding um, to pay uh, consultant fees. Um, to people so that, I mean, their voice is just as important. And if we don't identify that through pay um, as one mechanism, then we've already lost. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you. So that's um, folks in the profession being paid, folks in the community not being paid, but then being on the same uh, committees together. Uh, Kelly, I'm going to come to you in one second. I want us to jump us to the next um, slide because um, the Beth just shared actually dovetails into our next piece of hidden power. So we're going to clear out some of these pieces and then we're going to write hidden power. And in the hidden power, I'm hearing the pay infrastructure anywhere, right? Whether in a coalition um, or at a, at a, at a job, uh, professionally, um, pay structure, certainly power and what folks are being, how folks are being compensated and what that says. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, go ahead. I saw you put your hand up. I want to give you a chance. 
Yeah. Um, I was just going to kind of piggyback off what Beth said, because I think yeah. something that that I've struggled with and that I see, and I guess is, you know, part of these, and maybe it does <laughs> flow well into the hidden power part, but is that, you know, we have to keep people paid at a certain rate. Otherwise it messes up their benefits. Like I work in food insecurity. And so, you know, it will, could bump them off of SNAP benefits or something else. And so, um, you know, I think, yeah, again, I don't know exactly how that works within power, but I guess maybe like kind of just some of the the structures that we have in place kind of keeps those voices oppressed in many ways. Um, yeah. So anyways, thank you. Beth. Well, thank you, Kelly. I think there's the, um, the visible power of the law, what the law says, and then the hidden power of what the law actually does, right? Um, on one side, helping folks, and if they move to a certain other bracket, it now becomes a hindrance. Lauren, do you want to explain the uh, clip of that? That's exactly what Kelly was talking about. When you're eligible for certain benefits, that eligibility changes if you get, you know, I did a lot of work in the guaranteed income space, um, planning a guaranteed income program and trying to figure out which community members should be a part of the guaranteed income program and acknowledging or recognizing, and there's a lot of research being done at UMass here locally and all over the country, um, but someone will get part of a guaranteed income program. Let's say you're going to get, you know, $400 a month. Well, now you're going to lose the $500 childcare voucher that you had, for example. So you could be in a worse position because you were included in a guaranteed income program or got some kind of other income. And so then you lose benefits that are not in proportion. So there's like a lot of research done and a lot of math to figure out like how much more you'd actually have to get in order to get over the hump and be doing better than you were. And so with the particular program I was involved in, um, we decided to focus on families that don't traditionally get included in these kinds of programs. Um, the ones that are like making a little bit too much money to get a lot of those benefits, but are still not able to save for college or save for vacation or, you know, buy new tires when they need to. And so we we ran the program with those families, recognizing that we won't be subsidizing the government. You know, you know when you provide these benefits for families that are getting food stamps and the only difference is that now they're getting the money from the program instead of from the government. Now the government is saving money and the family is in the same position they were in. So that's my spiel on that. <laughs> Thanks, Winston. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Hidden Power, I see on the screen here, in-person statewide meetings being Boston-centric, which can limit people from other parts of the state. Absolutely, right? Who's involved? How easily do we make it for folks to be involved? Who has time to participate? Whose schedule is considered? Assumed agreement, inviting people who will go along with the majority, certainly. Recruitment efforts for councils. People need to submit an application, resume, CV, right? So we're putting up a lot of barriers a lot of gates, a lot of locks on those gates, right, which are not always clearly seen or really visible. Anything else? What about our funders, right? Who gets to fund in terms of, you know, who had, that means who is an investor, who actually has the capital, since capital has so much power, who has the ability to fund what's needed, um, the identities that are there as well. If you, you know, we, we, there have been discussions, we talked about politics, discussions around, there are states that have um, an incredible amount of black residents, but very black, very few black um, political representative representation. In the chats, should have had it in English to applications and resumes comment, absolutely. Okay, so we'll go to our last piece, invisible power. Give Victoria a second to undo some of our annotations. So invisible power is a little bit more conceptual, right? It is power that's sort of manifested around belief systems, psychological, ideological, um, and it's the isms we talked about, it's the power of sexism. Um, racism, right? So where are those sort of ideas, those belief systems that are shaping power and shaping meaning, giving power? This is also in connection with stereotypes.
Yeah, we are advisory of efforts to build psychological safety in groups with varying members of differing levels of power. Thank you, Gabrielle. It's always difficult um, to build safety into a group, right? Um, Lauren says this in, in a lot of our trainings and that it's really hard for someone else to know what makes you feel safe, right? It's, so there's a power in me just coming in and saying, here are the things that make us all feel safe. Let's let's move on and find put yourself in one of those categories, right? Rosa, the human resources department. Rosa, how so? Just a little more in the in the chat. Human resources. Uh invisible religious leaders influencing decisions of the congregation. I think that's a little bit of both, right? It's visible in terms of there's there's always a uh, a person that is, if you're thinking about a leader, that's a person you're thinking of. Right. And then, but the messaging and the interpretation of whatever religious uh, beliefs or texts that you use, there's certainly a lot of power in being able to frame that. And changing a lot of that context and meaning. Amanda, yes, I'm not sure if this is accurate, but I think invisible power would be thinking Christianity is the superior religion. Yeah, I think that can be, be across a lot of religions or a lot of belief systems and thinking that yours is the one, right? I'm not saying folks are right or wrong, but the belief in that, my beliefs are the ways that things should be run, which plays into much of how we build and structure our communities. And I think that's also speaking to the power of who is there, right? Who gets to speak. Perceptions of power influencing a person. Willingness or ability to a person's willingness or ability to use voice. Yeah. I'm not sure who wrote that one, but I'm thinking of um someone viewing their identity as a reason to not use power, first to not feel that they have voice. Or as Gary um put in the chat, being a white male, um, white men have a lot of power in our society, and perhaps my identity makes me feel that I have more power than I do, or that I'm owed more power. That is our, thank you for dropping that in there, Gary. And then who we consider. Certainly. So keep dropping some in the chat as we think about these um, across all three of these categories. And I'm going to pass it to Lauren and we're going to talk a little bit about breaking some of these things down, what that looks like. Go ahead, Lauren. Great. Thank you. Yeah, this was great. Um super interesting discussion. I just cleared the annotation. So, all right, here we are. Um, I think, so Winston and I have like led trainings on this idea and, and power and, and coalitions before. And I think this time we want to try something a little bit different. Um, when it comes to managing power in coalitions, I think a lot of that is like techniques of facilitation and like how you run a meeting and how you have all voices be heard. I think there's techniques of how you move through conflict as a group and, you know, conflict resolution skills and your, your approach to conflict. So there, and we do trainings on that. CHCI does trainings on both of those things. Um, and we have recordings of those trainings. You can go to hriainstitute.org and find recordings of trainings on facilitation, on conflict resolution, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm thinking about um, other struggles with power that you have seen or that you're currently dealing with. This is the part where you contribute the struggles you're having, <laughs> right? Or that you're observing out there in, in your communities and add them to the slide or like do the annotate function and add specific examples. So what we're going to do, here's a little foreshadowing of what we're going to do. We're, co we're coming up on break time. And so before we head out to the break, I want to like download all of the ideas that you came in here swimming in your mind. Like what made you want to come to this training session? You know, a specific example you might have about um, a power struggle that you have witnessed or that you're a part of or that you've seen in the past and kind of put all those ideas out there. And then when we come back from the break, this is where we do the popular education crowdsourcing model where you add the challenges that you're facing here. And when we come back, you get to choose a breakout room to go to that has a heading that you're like, oh, I've seen this. I can contribute ideas to this. 
right? So y'all are going to like mix and match and like, you're going to put your challenges here, but when we come back, then you're going to add your ideas, you know, and you don't have to have the answers. It's just, when you come back, there's going to be like, let's say four breakout rooms. You're going to self-select which one you want to go to, which kind of power struggle you want to grapple with or contribute ideas to. And then we're going to come back together and just debrief them all. So you'll get to see what folks said about each and every one of the challenges. So what questions do you have about what I just tried to say? <laughs> All right, in that case, please start adding some challenges to this to the slide. So I see one on here. Thank you to whoever contributed silent disagreement, how to recognize and create space rather than allowing disengagement to read as a scent. Yes. Yeah. It's true. I mean, I'm taking your silence as agreement <laughs> and then moving on instead of actually engaging and, you know, digging in to what is going on. Um, seeing in the chat, Chelsea saying, I was trying to say who we consider outside our coalition. How will this decision be read? What will the consequences be? I think that is in reference to something you said before about the previous slide, right? How to discern, talk about, apply, sharing versus shifting power. Yeah. What does it mean to share power versus shifting power? Making assumptions about people who traditionally have had power. Yeah. Yep, like same cast of characters, <laughs> you know, running this thing that ran the last thing. We already know what they want. We already know what they're going to do. Um, Feel free to come off mute if you, you know, if the annotate is not working for you or you want to drop something in the chat. Um, what kind of power struggles have you dealt with or seen or challenges you've experienced in power I'll, sharing? I'll, I'll just add that in, in uh, a follow up to the, the notion of a silent disagreement, uh, the issue of taking space can be problematic. Uh, and I'll say that both personally that sometimes I, I recognize the struggle I have of actually taking space versus observing others who are participating or not taking space when I think, mm, I think that person probably has something to add. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Thank you for that. It's very relatable <laughs> um, for me as well. Um, being in a space and thinking like, yeah, I know stuff. I should be contributing. I should be saying more. <laughs> they want to hear what I have to say. <laughs> And sometimes acknowledging that, like, if I just take up less space, the answers will come, you know. Passive aggressive behavior. I would love some details on that because that can mean so many things. <laughs> but yes, lack of diversity on the leadership team. Yeah, there's a struggle. And all the excuses that we can hear about why there's no diversity on the leadership teams. Boss, what, what did I miss? The, for those in positions of power, awareness of the role of mentoring, of bringing others along. Yeah, how to bring others along. If you have specifics, you know, you just, um, what do they call it? You like remove the specific names <laughs> and places <laughs> and you can share if you've seen, um, even if it's something that you've resolved, like it was a challenge that you had and it was resolved, maybe that experience can benefit others on this call. So you can put that challenge and see how others might have dealt with it. Other thoughts, things that we want to carry over from our previous discussion on hidden and invisible, invisible power. Gabrielle adds, effectively elevating the voices and needs of members of a committee. When you hold leadership role in the committee, which also holds power, 
and are someone of a privileged identity such as whiteness yes yes like like i alluded to earlier you know if i'm hired to go into a community and, and do some important public health work but i'm not a member of that community necessarily i care right it's important but maybe i'm not the most impacted person in the room so i have the power of you know my position but my job is really to lift up the power of the other people whose community we're talking about. I'm seeing, yeah, coalition members who participate as part of a paid role versus truly volunteer coalition members in the community. There's an inequity there, yeah. Respectful conflict, yeah. Um, thank you for sharing your lack of certainty around the exercise. Barrier busting can sometimes be respectful conflict. Yeah. Hey, we're trying something. Y'all are giving us the, the thoughts and ideas. While you're on break, we're going to be trying to pull out some themes, uh, maybe like hopefully three or four discrete themes that y'all will then brainstorm about. And we'll come back together and discuss some of the top favorites. <laughs> Paid roles tend to be employees who are not residents of the community. Yes, Stephanie. Yep. Yeah. And I know that there's work happening to try to counteract that you know i forget who mentioned it earlier trying to write it into the grants that like lo local folks are getting con consultation fees and being put on payroll for their contribution to the work because people's time is not free you know that's why you know the lack of community voice could be a result of oh folks are actually off you know feeding their kids picking them up from school making dinner going to work working that second job whatever the case may be very busting for new members and providing a welcome experience. Yes. How to, yeah. How to integrate, you know, you want to get more participation and then folks come in and they might feel like, well, this, this is an existing group. They already have a flow. I don't know where my place is. Grant related objectives, not allowing for organic change. Yeah. All that very visible power of the power of the purse, the funders directing what's happening or already deciding the answer and, and saying, here's what you got to go do rather than <clears throat> listening to the community. You know, is this a problem this community has and wants solved or did I just decide that I want to do something about this thing? Is there anything that was added that I did not lift up? All right. Well, I think at this time we want to give you a, a hard earned break. <laughs> so um, we will send you off to go do what you had to do, you know, go shovel some snow or pet your pet, <laughs> heat up your coffee or tea. And we'll come back at it's 1049 on the East Coast. So let's say 11 o'clock, right? That's 11 minutes. I like a nice round number, 11 o'clock. Stephanie agreeing, yes to the grant timelines. We need to know what to do over a year in advance. Volunteers don't work on that long. Yeah, that's true. They don't work on that long of a timeline. It's true. All right, see you all at 11 o'clock. Um, we would normally put a timer up so that it could remind you, but I'll just I'll just holler and, and draw you back with the sound of my voice because we want to keep these annotations up for a little while. Five. While you were off on break, we came up with five titles for the groups, for the barriers we would love to ask you to bust. So Victoria has created five self-selecting breakout rooms. And when she drops them up, when she puts them up, you'll get to pick which one you want to go to and which you know barrier you want to talk about among your colleagues. So the five titles are Community Representation, the second one is lack of diversity in leadership. The third one is integration of new members and ideas. Number four is sharing versus shifting power. And number five is avoiding conflict and silent disagreement. Oh, thank you, Gina. I was just about to do the same thing. So those five <laughs> titles are in the chat. So Victoria is going to put those up. Uh, hopefully, you know, you select sort of evenly but if you go into a room and you're all alone then come on back and we'll put you or you can go into a different room you might have you know a second choice that you'd be interested in and when you get back we will 
first of all, before you go, um, select someone to be a note taker, right? It could either be on a piece of paper in front of you or pull up a notes app, pull up the sticky notes, whatever is convenient. So that way you can capture some thoughts because when you come back together, we'll, we'll all jump in, share thoughts and get them onto a slide. That way, when we send these slides back out, all of the things you have contributed will be included. What is the difference with the first two? So one is community representation and one is lack of diversity in leadership. So I think, and jump in, Gina, Winston, anyone, community representation, meaning that the members of the community who are affected are showing up to meetings. They, this is like that, that uh, who's on payroll, who's not idea, volunteers, all of that, getting the community to be a part of solving the problem <laughs> that the coalition is existing for, right? And then lack of diversity in leadership is just that, like the same cast of characters, the, the comments someone made about, you know, having assumptions about what the leadership is or what they want or what they're doing based on their identities, perhaps could be talked about in there. Um, Gary is already in there waiting for you to discuss challenge, the challenge of lack of diversity in leadership. So how can we um, diversify the folks in charge? And there may be some overlap. There's lots of overlap. Um, and Mina, don't worry, because we're going to come back and debrief them all together and we'll all get to contribute to each of them. Say more about number four. So somebody dropped onto the screen sharing power versus shifting power. So what are some ideas and techniques for how we can share power among the coalition members? Um, yeah, anyone else want to jump in and add to that? I think outside I did I wrote that one and I, I think I don't know like I wrote it because it's I don't have it all like parsed out like what it means to shift power what it means to share power and like shifting power like is it necessary when is it necessary sharing power like when do you emphasize that and um, so how you balance those two like constructs I don't have a lot more to go on but, but. <laughs> Whoever chooses that room is going to parse it out. They're going to, you know, all the answers we need are right here. <laughs> we can just lift up. It's a brainstorm. You know, this is this is not the uh, we're not going to solve all of our coalition challenges with power today, but hopefully generate some ideas and share some thoughts. And I would say get out there. I think we're going to probably just do 10 minutes out there because I think a lot of the meat of the conversation is going to happen when everyone comes back and then can cross pollinate each of them and we'll take notes on the slides and send them out. So choose one and do your best <laughs> and take notes. Someone just take notes. And if you need help getting to one, let us know and we will send you there. Did you explain how, how to get into a, a room? Oh, so you should have a pop-up, a screen should have popped up that gives you the option to click join on one of the five options. If you don't see that, then if you navigate your mouse down to your bottom toolbar, you might have like a breakout rooms button or a more button where breakout rooms uh, pops up as an option. And if you click on oh, that, it should pop up the five options. Sorry, I thought it... it popped up on everyone's screen, but maybe it's because I'm a co-host. I see it on the top of mine. If those instructions were not helpful or did not work, just drop in the chat which room you want and we will put you there. I think. <laughs> I think I'm telling the truth. <laughs> and there's one person in integrating new members if anyone wants to join them and one person in sharing versus shifting power if somebody wants to join them for the conversation. If not, that's fine. We can go in and let them know that they can join another room, but that I throw it out there for folks as you make your choices. All right, Marielle is looking for room four, so I'm going to put Marielle in which one's room four? <laughs> Avoiding conflict and disagreement. Wait. Thank you. Actually, no, no, I'm sorry. It's shift, sharing and shifting power. Sharing and shifting. Yeah, sharing and oh, shifting wow. power. Okay, let me move her again. Avoiding conflict, Marielle. Move to sharing and shifting power. That's going to be fun. A little whiplash out there. Val, you're back. Joyce did come out there to join you in integration of new members. <laughs> For 
Welcome back from your breakout rooms, everyone. So we are going to attempt to capture your thoughts. As you can see on the screen, we've got a slide for community representation that Victoria is sharing. And so hopefully this group has selected someone to report out. And while you do that, Winston will try to capture your thoughts on the slide. That way, when you get a copy of these slides, your contribution will be there. And once the group has shared out, will be a chance for anyone else who didn't get a chance to join that group to jump in and drop some, you know, knowledge. So from the community representation group, is there someone selected to share a synthesis of your group's thoughts? We did not select anyone from the group. I did take some notes, so I can share the it's notes. It's you, Nancy, it's you. Yeah, I guess <laughs> so, um, sure. So, we focused a lot, of, I mean, on the challenges. I don't know that we came up with a lot of solutions. Um, we talked about, you know, the issue of paid versus unpaid uh, coalition members and how it can be a challenge, of course, um, to to bring people to the coalition who, you know, who have other things going on in their life who are not paid to be there, in other words. So yeah. talking about, you know, balancing, uh, offering meetings at times that are convenient for unpaid staff, but also balancing and being respectful of, of paid staff's time. So we're not all working in the evenings <laughs> uh, as well as the day. Uh, we also talked a little bit about paying people uh, you know, and uh, somebody suggested that there are some groups that have um, community boards where members uh, receive a stipend. Um, but, and we also discussed, I guess, making sure that that's not just sort of a performative thing that that those people also have a power to influence or impact decisions in the direction of the coalitions. Yeah. Um, and that you could include, I think somebody perhaps has included um, stipends or honorariums for community people in their grants and suggested doing that. Um, we talked a little bit about a specific issue in Western Mass of of uh, representation and the challenges of the, the large sort of geographic range there yeah. and the fact that, you know, that includes urban as well as, well as very rural areas. Uh, somebody suggested sort of, I guess, mapping, you know, a mapping exercise to help sort things out, like the different roles of the different agencies and making sure that there's clear representation. If there's anything else anybody from the group would like to add, please feel free to jump in. I just want to add um, the concept of avoiding tokenism when selecting people to be paid as consultants or representatives. Um, I don't really know again what the answer is because we're just a group of people with all the questions and not the answers. But um, I, yeah, just if there's attention to avoiding tokenism and if there needs to be a certain, I don't know, number of people who are paid as community consultants, I'm not really sure what the answer is there. I just know it could be a, a problem or a challenge. Yeah, no, that's, you make a great point. And that's something we talk about in, you know, community engagement, as well as youth development in our programs. Um, when you have one person that you put forward as, you know, on the brochure or whatever, <laughs> um, but they don't actually get any say and they don't do, they're not part of the decision-making. Um, they're not really representing any community. They're not being consulted for real. Yeah, I think just naming it and being aware of what tokenism is and what the alternatives are um, is really important. But I love these thoughts, you know, it made me wonder in terms of like scheduling meetings at times that work for staff and community members, like having the staff be able to flex their time so that working morning, noon and night, running meetings um, in locations that are accessible with parking and public transportation. I know when I was running community meetings at a community organization, we wanted folks to come at dinner time. And so I know this is not always possible, but having food there and having childcare available. So like you want to come bring your kids, <laughs> they'll be fed, you'll be fed. And we're taking care of all the business that needs to happen at 630 at night. Um, because even getting kids from school, getting homework done, et cetera, et cetera, is challenging enough. So for being able to provide food and childcare or getting that donated or, or being able to divide duties, somehow being creative around those things is really key. Anyone else from any of the groups who's, who are like, are like, yeah, what about this? <laughs> Feel free to 
drop in the chat or come off mute and share with us how you've dealt with this challenge. I guess I want to talk on tokenism. I have a funky voice. I'll say that again. Um, I've experienced tokenism in, in some of the roles in, in my jobs. And it's not, I have to say disclaimer, not to the one that I currently am in right now. Um, but I've had <clears throat> roles where they valued the perception of what I could add. But I was my ideas would not be greeted and I wasn't part of the decision-making process ever. Um, I would receive just straight up instructions mm. um, on here's what to do. <laughs> wow. So mm -hmm. if you float in one direction, people like the idea of you being there and the perception that you were there, but actually you were receiving and not actually contributing. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for sharing that lived experience with what has been named as an issue on community representation. I appreciate that. Thank you for listening. I saw Gary come off mute and I think someone else might have played with the mute button. I did. And I just wanted to kind of throw in real quickly the notion of uh, in-person versus Zoom meetings. Thank you. Uh, and that can be both a blessing or a curse depending upon people's needs and availability of technology, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, and running hybrid meetings is really hard. It's challenging to run hybrid meetings. So if that's something that you want to take on, go to hriainstitute.org and watch our training from last year on running hybrid meetings because it's an art and a skill and it's it can be worth it, but it's not, not super easy. It takes a team to run it because you need somebody facilitating the Zoom meeting as well as somebody facilitating in person and working together um, to collaborate. I, I've done trainings that were hybrid and, you know, it's not easy, but for, for ease of access and getting that representation is, it's worth it. I think it's worth it. There's the matter of doing asynchronous work as well and having folks be able to contribute um, ideas on their own time and the note-taking that gets shared out. That way folks who aren't able to make it, because someone mentioned earlier, who's in the room is who has power, you know? Like they were there that day, so they got to vote. <laughs> when, you know, there are ways to to distribute that power across time and place by, you know, not having, you know, the gavel that someone referenced, <laughs> voting is over happening. Chelsea says town, town government, schools need to do better at this childcare, food, accessibility, rather than guilt in the community and saying if they don't show up, they don't care. Yeah, absolutely. And on top of that, are these meetings, like, do people feel heard in the meetings? Like, you're going to stop going if you feel like I'm just here to receive information. They don't actually need me here. Like, could this meeting have been an email, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, we've done trainings on how to engage youth in coalitions and how to make meetings engaging and dynamic for young people. And I swear everything that's good for young people is good for adults as well. <laughs> you know, we want to have engaging meetings as well. We want to not feel tokenized. We want to feel like our voices are heard. We want to have uh, constructive ways to contribute. Um, I could go on and on, but I feel like we should go to the next slide because we've got a lot to cover. But thank you to this group on community representation. So we've got lack of diversity in leadership. And I know there's gonna be crossover, right? These are not all discrete issues, but I'd love to hear if um, Beth or Gary or Kylie or Rosa will self-nominate <laughs> to share the ideas of this group. And I already want to lift up Rose's comment in the chat that I did not mention, language access, having materials translated, having translators, having live translation, if possible, um, engaging in translation services. And, and also level of, of, of language, you know. Um, yeah. I, I don't also want to emphasize um, translation, but also the level of, of, of language, you know, um, grade level. Yeah, um, you know, absolutely. Pictures. That's in any language. That's in every language. Yeah, exactly, including pictures and so forth. Yeah. And so that was something that I did mention in the um, diversity and leadership. And um, and I shared my my own personal experience being in in in, um, in a leadership position where I am the only person of color on a leadership team, and how. Um, 
difficult it could be navigating um, even just the group. It's also it's like navigating a whole system, and mm -hmm. so um, and and you're go, trying to go upstream while, while the, the the leadership is, team is going downstream. And yeah. I shared how that could also um, pose a, a physical. Um, and even traumatic experience um, on, on an individual. So, um, because while you're trying to work with integrity, um, sometimes it, it's not what one um, faces in reality. Yeah. So, Thank you. For I, I don't know if any others want to chime in. I I I didn't take notes because it took me down a, a different um, path in my own personal experience. So, if others on my group want to share, I I just wanted to highlight Kylie's point about how closely related this topic, lack of diversity in leadership, is to community representation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. If we, if we don't have the community represented in the room, then they're not going to get elected to leadership. Yeah, it's true. And I, I, Rosa, thank you for sharing, you know, your experience and the fact that it took you on a separate journey is, is okay. And hopefully, you know, not um, detrimental, but I think that sh your sharing is valuable for everyone in the room to hear that. Yeah, you can have all the diversity you know, we can put diversity first, but if we don't actually create conditions that make it, you know, safe and accessible for everyone, then we're just bringing in folks and then doing them harm and then they're going to leave and we're not getting anywhere um, because we're just harming members of the community instead of, you know, working together to uplift their voices. I like what you said about, oh, go ahead. Somebody came off mute. Is it Anne? It's just joining back. Feel free to use the raise hand function too, and then you get called on and, and don't have to <laughs> figure out who's sharing next. <laughs> I like what Rosa said about the um, language level and the level of things that are in writing and um, and that goes for all, all languages, any language. Um, you know, I, I worked as part of a affordable housing community where the board was made up of 51% community members and the, the difference between community members and, you know, the types of people you would typically find on a board of uh, housing development, like a nonprofit, um, was different, was not the same. And that's a good thing, right? Like we need, we need all voices to be heard. They can't be all the same. Like Winston was referring to earlier, like I can't create safety for everyone in the room because I don't know what your experience is. So... Anyone at all want to add to this struggle of lack of diversity in leadership? Um, I want to add something quickly. I think I know these two things are connected. I didn't write any notes yet on lack of diversity in leadership. I think um, why these two are different to me is that I can have a seemingly diverse group in leadership and still not represent the community, right? So it's those conversations where we're talking about, I think one of our slides later is, you know, navigating conflict and having an understanding of the folks that you are trying to serve. And so um, to Marielle's point about um, tokenism, a lot of that happens when we look at diversity and identity in a very narrow lens and think that having one or possibly two is representing, <clears throat> excuse me, representing a community or that these folks have community voice and not having a true understanding of what is needed right so it's both in terms of i in my community so you know I've, I've been around tokenism and there's some times where um people who are different than the folks in the power structure have to almost volunteer volunteer themselves in that in that token role because it helps you to push forth in your own goals right and so you sort of take the arrows or you deal with all of the uncomfortable situations and all of the power imbalances hoping that perhaps a person after you um, has the ability to speak up or that your ability to call out some things in leadership or um, or power structure allows for change. And sometimes um, that is correct. I think some of this is where we're talking about how do we really truly connect with folks in the community and how do we manage those difficult conversations, right? 
um, because we bring in folks from the community. We bring in folks that are from different viewpoints, different racial, uh, different gender identities, different um, societal structures, but we don't change our own structures of our coalitions, or our organizations to represent those people. So bringing someone in into an existing power, uh, a power structure without any change to the power structure can only provide more harm, right? Mm -hmm. so if we don't change what's already there to say, okay, we have different people here, we have different voices. How, what is the review of our coalition and what we do in terms of how we now represent these folks differently? And that's the implementation of uh, and change. It's not just folks come in and where they're supposed to act the same or have the same viewpoints. Is that you're now not only you're changing sometimes how your organization needs to work, and you have to hear from these folks and be willing to put that implement to implement those changes. I think going back to our start, we talked about you know um, the hidden isms and the things that factor into power and not realizing sometimes that that existing power structure really, really benefits you and that the change mm -hmm. requires for you to step back from a bit of um, wielding some of that power um, with, you know, a few checks and balances. But that's what I think when I, when I see both, how this can be different is that um, seeming, seeming diversity or uh, simply having only folks there on the surface or something that's very shallow can be just as harmful if we're not talking about our community and folks from the connection to the community. Yes, thank you, Winston. I love how you mentioned like who benefits from this structure of how leadership is set up. Marielle adds in the chat that the lack of diversity affects decision-making, includes the safety lens when assigning roles, safety lens when situations of racism affect your staff. Yeah. All right, I, I know we've got a lot to get through, so I'm gonna move us along. And it's a variation on a theme because the next group was talking about the integration of new members and ideas. So I know this feeds into the community representation pipeline, which feeds into the leadership pipeline. So we're just moving farther upstream. Um, Chelsea says regarding tokenism, I think a lot of us blindly believe that just inviting people autom automatically makes them feel valued and equal. That's a great point. It's not just about an invitation. It's about you know what we do once you get here. Yeah, thanks for that. So for folks that were in the integration of new members and new ideas room, that was a cell phone number that I'm not sure was able to participate, but Joyce and Val were in there. I can make a few comments and then if the other members want to jump in. Um, I did have this happen to one of the groups that I'm a part of. We started out with 60 members, and then um, I think it was about a year ago, we had 10 sitting in a call. So it came up as something that we really needed to look at if we wanted to continue this group. So we did come up with some ideas and some comments. Um, one was orientation packets and members going through onboarding, which the, member, the orientation packets could include them like your vision, um, what the group was about, anything that needed um, the members needed to know um, in regards to that. Um, building and maintaining relationships and building trust and understanding that they take time and helping new members um, by helping build those relationships as new members come on board. Um, refreshing purpose, roles, and directions of the group. I think that was a big thing that this group that I was involved with looked at. Um, what was their mission? It was different than it in COVID than it was post COVID, well, I shouldn't say post COVID, but anyway, you get my draft. Um, that, you know, it was time to look at, you know, are we in an emergency, you know, mindset or do we need to look at what we want to do going forward? Um, Ensuring representation of all groups who should be at the table. Rebuilding when necessary for membership and inclusion. Uh, clear identification of activities. What is this group of, is about? What are we looking to do? Where do we want to go? Do we want to do activities? Do we want to get involved in a different direction in the community? Um, being intentional about who needs to be at the table and when. I thought that was really important. Mm. Um, my role demands that I'm a part of a lot of coalitions and groups and work groups. And so, you know, I, I really need 
to, to have a, an idea of, do I fit into this group? Do I need to be there? When do I need to be there? Um, and someone else talked about, you know, setting up um, groups, different groups. You can be a part of a big group and then break down into small groups. What small group do, does that member need to be a part of? And um, the structure of the coalition itself. Do we have to meet weekly? Do we have to, eat, do we have to meet monthly? Do we have to meet quarterly? If um, I'm a new member and something is coming up at a meeting, do I need to be at that meeting? Or would it be better if I was at the meeting that's coming up next week? So really being intentional and helping new people when they come on understand what that coalition is all about and um, various groups and different directions of those groups and where I fit in. I know I just talked to circle spot. No, that was fantastic. You named so many things. A lot of things were coming up, including, you know, the orientation materials and it's transparency. It's letting folks know where we've been, where we are, where we're going. Right. And so folks are catching up. They're reading the previous meeting minutes and they've got the orientation. That's got like all the basic stuff they need to know to feel like they're caught up and not an, an, an out, you know what I mean? Like an out person who's on the outside looking in. No, they're being integrated. And maybe that includes a buddy system. You know what I mean? Someone, because you talk about relationships. So everything is relationship oriented. You know, um, people want to feel like they belong, like they matter. This ha this is true everywhere. <laughs> it's true at work. It's true at home. It's true at school. Um, we want to feel like we matter and we belong. But, but yet our time is not being wasted. So I like what you said about subcommittees. You know, subcommittee can go off and work on a certain thing and come back and report out to the big group and transparency about that. You know, it's not like, oh, all my friends are hanging out without me. <laughs> you know, it's we know what's happening and there's a schedule and, you know, we, we know we don't need to be there um, and we'll come back together when, when the time is right. So thank you. Other folks in that group or anyone want to add to this? Uh, this is Val. Thank you, Joyce. Um, you summarized that um, great, wonderfully. Um, I do want to add that um, with intentional, being intentional about who's at the table, I think that also can relate to um, retention of our members. And I think our other members said that, how do we do that? I think everyone gets, has that issue, how to keep our members involved and interested and in, in our committees. So, yeah, that, that I think is one that we could add and work on. Yeah, thank you, Val. It's so key. Um, I think I forgot one too, which I think is kind of important, is inheriting previous um, perceptions from previous uh, participants. Val brought up one about budgets and, and the impact of the change between leadership and the budgets and how they get applied. And also, I think in my position, um, the individual who had the position before me um, had a different focus on things. And so that individual lost a lot of the credibility that, that um, I followed. And so I had to build, it goes along with trust yep. and having those coalitions or committees understanding that, that I'm here for the long haul and that um, I approach things different. I think building that is really important. Absolutely. Trust, relationships, transparency. And then I think just building on um, what else, and I don't know if we, we went down this all the way, but just adaptability. So you can come into a coalition thinking, you know, this is the structure of it, but I think being adaptable once all the members get to the table. Um, and I, I don't also think that all the members ever get to the table either. Like, so we, you know, we have to think of it that way, but um, just making sure that we're totally flexible and we're really listening to the group. Um, I've been on coalitions where we thought, you know, we should meet, um, monthly, this is how it's going to be. You write a grant and this is what the work plan says. But yep. you know what? When you get to the table, we need to meet every two weeks for a while, but then we can go to monthly. And then, you know, that um, it, what's the timing of it? So I think just adaptability is so critical and maybe having um, agreements with your members is really important too. So everybody's on the same page that you can build into onboarding and orientation. Um, that level of transparency, like you said, it, it just helps with that. Yes, thank you for that. That's true. Some coalitions are are together for the long haul. They are long standing coalitions with lots of work to do and they'll never end. And others come together for a shorter period of time for a certain project or event or something. And 
they're different, but I think the group norms, having norms and agreements, um, being flexible and adaptable, like recognizing that what we were doing isn't working anymore and we need to change because I often hear, well, that's how it's always been done. That's just how it's always been done. So, yeah. Love that. Think of like rotating responsibilities too you know like that's the person who's always been the note taker and so they're gonna always be the note taker but like no maybe we rotate that job around we rotate all the jobs around um that new members feeling integrated feeling like they have a role um things get done in different ways there's not just one right way to do everything okay that was wonderful if there's any other thoughts i'd love it um did i miss anything in the chat i have not so let's continue because we are Plugging along. And the next one, sharing versus shifting power. Amanda, Gabrielle, and Marielle were in there together. Yes. We kind of agreed that we were all going to take a second <laughs> to read through the bullet points that we made. Yes. Um, it, the conversation started a little bit kind of like, oh, I don't know. So we went um, <laughs> and looked for the definitions to make sure that we could have like a consistent answer and, and compare and balance off ideas of each other of how it like impacts us differently in our lines of work. Um, so shifting power in philanthropy, it's valuing life experience of those who are historically marginalized. Um, and so sharing is a collaboration of the people who already have power or are in a position mm -hmm. of power um, versus deferring, you know, the partner is removed when community makes uh, a decision, it's shifting. And I'm going to allow the space for Gabrielle. Um, okay, I'll do the next two. Um, so we also talked about being intentional um, with who's in the room. Um, and making sure that the like key stakeholders are you know in the room for discussion to hear from community and also when decisions are being made. Um, and another piece of that, um, and this is I kind of related to this a bit as far as my leadership role, um, like using being intentional and strategic and um, using parts of your identity or privilege in a way that's most effective. Um, so being strategic with your co um, um your co-leaders um and you know assessing the room and their needs. Um Marielle's nodding her head because she helped me kind of <laughs> figure this out in my head. Um to make sure that um you know, the needs of the group and of the people that you're trying to elevate um, are being met and also, you know, using that privilege sometimes that other people may not, it let, it has less risk for you to try to push, push certain things. And then, oh, this was Amanda's, um, the listening sessions. Yeah. Uh <laughs> So, yeah, I spoke about some of the work that we've been doing. Um, again, they helped me kind of figure out what was what. So um, in the community, we've been doing listening sessions where we invite pretty much anyone in the community who wants to participate um, that is SNAPED eligible um, to come and talk about the strengths in their community and the challenges they're facing and then any possible solutions that they have for some of those challenges. And then um, this upcoming, well, currently, I guess this fiscal year, we are taking the solutions that the community came up with and working with another community organization that is made up of, um, again, staff at eligible community members and having them do participatory budgeting, um, which they basically are reading our reading the findings from the prior um, last year's listening sessions and deciding what it is they want the state to fund moving forward. Um, so we said that that was um, like sharing, sharing the power because they are um, basically deciding what is gonna be funded um, based off of what the community spoke about last year in our listening session. So yeah, 
that's kind of what we talked about. I want to also throw out an example out there if it's possible. Um, I always think of when you ask me to bring something and I think of the immediate line of work that I'm doing uh, and part of the work that we're doing in the coalition of Gardner impacts uh, immigrant population that's coming in. Most of them are coming from Haiti. Um, and so in the first initial meetings, we had meetings with the people who were directly addressing the situations that they had, whether it was housing, whether it was MOC, whether it was the city of Gardner representatives. Um, and I would say that that's a sharing of power and it was well intended, super productive too. Um, and then by the second, third meeting, we realized that we didn't have a Haitian representative in the room uh, and that we can think that we know what they need, but we cannot speak for them as to what they need. So the next breakfast that we had, we actually invited one of the Haitian representatives into the meeting and it was insanely powerful to be able to shift that position of power as well and to be able to give that person the room. And it's it's important to recognize when you're sharing power, which is not bad, right? But sometimes you need to shift it. Fantastic. I have no notes. This was great. <laughs> and the fact that you drop your notes in the chat for all to enjoy is wonderful. Um, yeah, that's how I process things. <laughs> yeah, I that. That was great. All right, it's coming up on the noon hour, so it, it, it behooves me to, to move us along. Um, Y'all did a fantastic job. So but last but not least, avoiding conflict slash silent disagreement. We had a group of six discussing this, so I wonder if you all have uh, someone to share your thoughts. Um, I'll share because I was the note taker um, and I was the one who came with all the questions and shout out to my group because they came with all the answers. Um, so I'm just basically going to... Um, read back the really wonderful things that they said. Um, so we started by talking about um, what um, what creates that atmosphere of silent disagreement and it's kind of assuming agreement. Um, it's like ass assuming that um, you're um, that seeking agreement and seeking um, uh, for everyone to be kind of on the same page is um what is what the goal is um and our group members said that um we really need to start by assuming conflict and differences in dynamics assuming um differences in perspective and experience and seeking or welcoming conflict and really valuing it and starting from that position um, which shifts it um, to to really make space for people to have um, disagreement and, and open conflict instead of um, silent or hidden conflict and disengagement. Um, and um, some folks said that um, when that comes up, um, sometimes we need to sit with it, um, understand it, explore the origin of the conflict, kind of um, assess like, is this a personal, a professional and ideological conflict, what's the nature of this particular conflict, um, and that we can't always resolve it in the moment. Um, sometimes we need to make time to follow up, um, resolve, and, and um, somebody brought up a really wonderful point about um, tagging, like saying like, can we meet about this, um, but like meeting around common ground and common goals and things that are um, important to to both of you, but then also resolving the conflict so that it isn't just a, hey, can we have this really hard meeting where we're just going to talk about our conflict? Um, and um, somebody else brought up um, going back to your norms, your whatever you've set up as group norms and your group goal. and is it really important that we move this agenda along and that we get everything done in this meeting and that means tabling this piece of the conversation or is it important that we address this right now and that we move through this um, even if that means that other things don't get done um, and like going back and reframing your um, going back to what's what's your why and what's your who um, and um, re-examining the conflict from the perspective of um, like, what are we trying to accomplish? Are we trying to accomplish the same thing? Um, and um, how are we um, 
So examining the nature of the conflict that way. Yeah. Did I miss anything, group? I'm seeing folks saying that you nailed it. And I appreciate that you contributed a lot to that conversation about avoiding conflict and silent disagreements. I think I want to lift up the notion of being aware of power dynamics in a conflict because uh, a conflict between two parties of differing power cannot be mediated, right? If, if there's a power differential, it cannot be mediated. There's a different kind of um, resolution or, or method for resolving that that would need to be considered. So power plays a role in how conflict can be resolved. Having systems in place, not being afraid of conflict, all of these things, how to give feedback, you know? I like how you said bringing it back to the mission. You know, how do we get from, you know, me versus you to us, like get us, us on the same team. Anyone else want to add anything? Anyone who wasn't in this group? have thoughts around addressing conflict. All right, well, with that, I think it's time for us to continue on our journey and I'm gonna hand it over to Winston. Some folks alluded to, you know, power mapping and it's maybe maybe you saw the notes i don't know go ahead winston all right so um a couple activities here for us to dig deeper into power and how we see it in our coalitions um, we've got about 30 minutes left so this is going to seem uh, a little quick so i want you all um either a piece of paper pen or notes app again or the word doc on your computer uh, make your version of this power map. So across the top, we have some varying uh, labels along identity, gender, age, race, education, ability, and class. And then finally, we have stake. Uh, stake here represents the stake that each of these will have in the mission of the organization. You can use um, two words. High stake or low stake? High stake meaning they are incredibly impacted by the mission, incredibly invested, and low stake meaning not as impacted, right? Uh, decisions of the organization sort of have a low uh, personal result or impact on this class. So high or low stake. So those identities across the top and then down the left, the labeling of the groups. So coalition leadership, coalition members, the community that the coalition serves, and then yourself. All right, so we're gonna take about, let's make it about seven minutes, we'll go to about 12.10, and you fill this out for your coalition. So those four groups, those six forms of identity, as well as the stake, high or low, of each of those groups. Victoria, if you want to play some great uh, contemplative uh, thinking music. Wait, and, Winston, could you do one example? I'm not totally, could you like do one like intersection just as an example? Yeah, um, okay, sorry. <laughs> I, I will do one. So I am a member of a, um, a coalition in my town that is based around anti-racist um, practices and wanting to see them executed in our schools as well as um, our town leadership. Okay. So I'll say our coalition leadership uh, gender, we would be, we are predominantly led by Black women. I'll say that in our leadership. Uh, ages, we range between 38 to 48. Uh, race, uh, predominantly Black, but we incorporate other folks of color. Education, almost all post-undergrad, uh, post so graduate degrees. Um, ability, all able-bodied. Um, class upper middle class um, to borderline wealthy for some folks and then stake for the impact I would put high because okay. we, so descriptive all the way across the board thank you thank, thank you so much any other questions all right
next slide. Real quick. So let's look at this first question. So with the demographic information that you just filled out, um, is there anything, are there any obvious power imbalances that you see? Do you see any differences in power or any really clear differences across stakeholder categories, that leadership, membership, community members, or yourself? Did anything jump out to you as you're writing this in terms of power? Um, you can drop it in the chat or come off mute and share if you'd like, raise your hand. I'll add in the second question as well. Maybe that will help a little bit. Like, What differences or similarities did you see across the kinds of power along those stakeholder categories, if any? Anything that we did notice, even outside of these first two questions, anything we noticed as we went through the activity? I can add something. I was going to type it, but it seemed like it was going to take too long. So I'll just say that looking at the demographics, um, since we serve SNAP Ed eligible populations, there was a clear like class difference um, as the community we serve has to qualify for needs-based assistance. So um, that was just the main thing that popped out to me. Thank you, Amanda. Class difference should make, uh, makes clear sense in terms of folks who are working in an organization around SNAP and SNAP-Ed and folks who are receiving SNAP services. Amanda, I'll I'll ask, are, um, well, let me know if this is not something you want to get into, but um, are there folks in your organization or does the organization try to incorporate folks who are um, you snap or uh... yeah I think we um and not I don't know this only like anecdotally but I mean I think there are people that have used it in the past um maybe not currently but um and also I don't know at the state level like the people working with um working with the community like our implementing agencies I don't know what their hiring practices are but that's actually something we're exploring in another project I'm doing. So, um, yeah, possibly, I guess, is the answer. <laughs> but it's not something that's necessarily openly shared or something that folks are they're trying to incorporate that point of view necessarily. Um, Gary says, first thing I notice is disparity of class between communities served and the other groupings. Thank you, Gary. Shall see the people in leadership and even membership tend to be the people who have the greater capacity, time, resources, education, professional background, and ability. Certainly. So uh, I think that's three or four instances of, of big class distinctions in leadership versus leadership and membership versus community served. And with the time that comes with being of the upper half of the classes, the time to be a part of membership, that is also voice, that is empowerment in that time, in addition to the wealth. For Mina, visible disparities, dis disabilities are unsurprisingly hard to identify, but really affect the ways in which people can and can't participate in all those categories of people. Thank you for sharing that, Mina. Because we didn't, I don't think we put that in any of our invisible powers, right? Uh, ableism, um, and thinking of folks who, I'm thinking about things that are not clear to see, thinking of folks with um, different cognitive processes, right? Folks who think and share and process very differently. 
other folks, you can add in the last two questions as well in terms of our consideration. What does the power map and this imbalances, if any that you've seen, um, say about the power of leadership versus the power of the community? And also, how does this affect your work in your relationship with power with the stakeholders in each category? What's the impact of these imbalances really across that entire power map? If we see none, I think we can we can voice that as well. If we went through our power map and saw and said, you know, I think my organization, my coalition is doing a great job in terms of recognizing our imbalances, please um, speak that into the space as well. I think this is more about just saying, did we see anything as we analyzed our coalition versus our mission and the folks that are involved in setting it? I think we recognize where there is room for improvement. There's work to be done nonetheless, but we are walking towards that goal. Thank you, Mario. Mario, can I ask, um, you can follow up in the chat if you'd want. Um, is there a process within your coalition around sort of an analysis about where there is space for improvement? Um, we actually right now have a DEIB assessment being done um, towards our, <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to translate this in my head, my main language is Spanish, bear with me. So we are trying to, so we have a, a, a third party to say it that way, doing a DEIB assessment on us so that we as an organization can also have an assessment that we are going to participate in and recognize where it is that we have the room for growth and then we're going to choose that one immediate goal to work in in, in around the many goals that we have to work in but we are going to recognize the one goal that we uh, want to work on and then we're going to get some funding to get the education to work on that goal so i would say that there is something so a uh, third party assessment and then working putting those goals together as a group um us as an institution recognizing where it is that we could work Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other folks. You know, I wrote high stakes all around, which helps support a feeling of solidarity. Thank you. Nina. And when we put the idea of stake is to say, you know, there, there can be a coalition where folks who are in charge of leadership are not necessarily part of the community. Right. And so uh, aside from a professional value, the impact of certain missions may not be direct on the leadership could have a much, you know, the community could have a lot more at stake. Others, thoughts, comments on this exercise? Stephanie, for the power map, would it make more sense to have recovery status or lived experience for a youth drug profession coalition? Absolutely, absolutely. I think it could be its own column, uh, Stephanie. Um, this is something where this can be changed and used and you put in the categories that uh, work well or work best for your coalition. Um, we use categories here because we're not sure who's coming to the, who's gonna be in the room for each of our trainings. So we try to make this as broad and all encompassing as possible, but it, you can get as specific as you would like um, for, your, for your organization. Other folks. Okay. 
Uh, if anything comes up as we go through the rest of the, this next uh, nine minutes or so, please drop it in the chat or raise your hand. But I want to share um, our best practices, which we've really kind of touched on organically throughout this training. And this kind of pulls everything together. Again, not a static list. Um, we never say that anything that we're doing is static and and written in permanence and cannot be changed. We need to be adaptable, not only for the times that we're in, but the, for, for the communities that we serve. So best practices in managing power and power sharing. One of the big things that we talked about today, determine how you will manage disagreements. How will you handle conflict within your coalition? Uh, we had some great ideas about welcoming conflict, about being open to it, um, not turning a blind eye to it, acting that it's not there, and not simply settling in the spaces that are easiest. But we do need to have some practices about how to manage these disagreements, that they are consistent and clear. Right? And then secondly, establish how decisions within your coalition will be made. Right, that is who makes it, who whose voice whose voices are there, how are the voices incorporated? Um, how are those decisions impacted by new members, which we discussed in our breakout groups? Then authentically engaging stakeholders and including all our stakeholders in decision making, our community engagement, new members, leadership, community, folks, our staff as well as ourselves, developing effective and clear communication strategies. One of the main things here is informing folks who are involved in terms of the work of the coalition. Uh, there's also the, com the concept of weaponized ignorance, right? Folks say, well, I didn't know what was happening or I didn't know this was how we, our process. We're eliminating that. Also making it very open very easy to find. And that's where we talk about shared knowledge and information, freely available and accessible, getting rid of those barriers. That's our barrier busted, right? That's not uh, gatekeeping. That's making sure all that information is incredibly available. Um, we did some talk about uh, government. Now, um, if you're involved in your local governments, uh, since the pandemic, we now have the idea of Zoom meetings and the recording of Zoom meetings, right? Freely available and accessible. And I'm a town meeting member and on a few committees in town. And sometimes I say, it's too much trouble to record the meetings, but I have to be amenable and adaptable because it's because just because it's a headache for me does not mean it's the right way to go, right? Leaving that information out there for those who would like to view it. If they don't, they don't, but the information needs to be accessible. Consistent periodic review of our coalition. That's why we started with talking about our why, our mission, um, exercises like our power maps, exercises as uh, reviewing our coalition, the third party, um, which Marielle shared, right? That's a review of things like decision-making process, systems and structures, what's in place that no longer works. Oftentimes we leave things as a set it and forget it, and it does not work anymore for our mission and who and whom we are serving. And then always a review of impact. Even from the beginning of our agreements with the ouch and oops, what is the impact of our current work? And is it still in line? Um, when we are organizing and working in coalitions and our work is so important and has so much uh, value for the folks that we are working with, move a little fast and we forget our impact even with the best of intentions uh, we can have unintended impact and consequences to our work and collaboration not competition i think this was voiced very well when we discussed um conflict and how to manage that conflict and welcoming it and that we are not in competition with each other in a coalition there was also a discussion we had about bringing in outside coalitions and partnerships and thinking that we are in collaboration, even if there are some bumps in the road that remain sort of right next to that North Star of your mission. And collaborating not only internally, but externally with your community and your community groups. And then finally, discussing and addressing power and power imbalances. 
this can again be an awkward and sometimes tough conversations for folks to sink in. Because this is a discussion of identity, a discussion of history, a discussion of mission, and a discussion of what is and what, what is present and the feelings of others. And sometimes some of us may leave with a bit less power than we walked into the discussion with. And are we okay with changing those infrastructures because it may save, serve our coalitions and our communities in a better way. So in this last three minutes, uh, we're gonna drop a feedback form. And as we drop the feedback form to hear from you all, I just still wanna hear from folks in the chat, their thoughts on this slide of best practices. Again, not static, not it is not every piece, but it's a lot of the pieces that we touched on today. And also a word from you in terms of what you're taking away from today's session, your feelings, thoughts, ideas, as you click and work on that feedback form for the next couple of minutes. It's our chance to kind of air it out, drop your thoughts in the chat, raise your hand, come off mute. Let's spend the last uh, few minutes together um, kind of sharing. the feedback form in the chat victoria just sent well folks are working on that feedback form uh, i just want to draw attention to and you have these slides you'll get another copy of these slides that have all our notes from today this page is showing how you can find us i would um you all know about us because you're here but if your coalition is not registered in the one and only statewide coalition database that the Community Health Training Institute manages. Um, I dropped the link in there if you would add or update your coalition info. That would be great. Um, yes, and as Victoria dropped in the chat, CHTI, we're about halfway through our training year, so there's a bunch more trainings coming up, but the next one is called Advancing Health Equity at Work. It's going to be on March 1st. It's going to be virtual, so you can find all these trainings at hrainstitute.org. And we really do take your feedback into strong consideration. <laughs> um, these results get reported back to the state and then we use them to improve and develop our trainings. So appreciate y'all taking the time to do that. And if anyone has any thoughts or comments or takeaways that you wanna drop in the chat before you go, we'd love that as well. <laughs>